we go. There we go. We're going to go ahead and begin the Congressional Fireside Chat. We'll begin uh, with the National Anthem, if you will. Let's hope we'll the flag first. So, uh, by the numbers, ready? Two. Do the Pledge of Allegiance. Who will your cover? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bring you greetings and we ask you to watch over us as we begin this fireside chat. We ask you to bless each and every one of us and especially when I ask you to bless all of our military men and women who are serving in places of great danger in Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq. We pray for all of our veterans who find themselves homeless in these winter months. And now let's have a moment of silence for our POWs and MIAs. And we'll make this prayer in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Uh, please be seated. We're going to go ahead and welcome to the stage uh, Leo Shane, who will be the moderator for Military Times. He is joined by Chairman Johnny Isaacson from the great state of Georgia, along with Senator Tester, the ranking member for the Senate Veteran Affairs Committee. We also have Dr. Phil Rowe, the ranking member for the House Veteran Affairs Committee, and joining us momentarily will be the chairman of the uh, House Veteran Affairs Committee, Congress Marticano, who uh, I believe has gotten stuck in traffic. So we will begin uh, and uh, let them take it from here. Of, uh, the American Legion or any other BSOs for that. 
thank you very much. I think we've got uh, moving forward with, with the VA itself. Um, I've said before, I'll say it again, I, I think uh, Secretary Wilkie has the skills uh, to be able to run the VA in a very, very positive way. As Johnny said, we've given the tools they need to be successful, and we need to do the oversight to make sure that it is, uh, the VA is living up to the, the needs of our veterans uh, around this country. Um, that being said, uh, oversight of the Mission Act, or oversight of the Appeals Bill, oversight of the VA in general is going to be critically important because we had a very successful Congress last Congress from a, a VA perspective, from a veterans perspective, because we were able to to pass bills that have been sitting around for a while and then some new ones too. I think just moving forward very quickly and then I'll let the House side take care of this, but the Vietnam Blue Water Veterans issue is, is an important issue. I hope the VA does not challenge that court decision. I hope it just goes through and we take care of the folks who, who fought off the shores of Vietnam. Um, and then the second one that we've got to deal with and we're going to be introducing the bill next week on uh, on suicides, uh, which is unacceptable, and it's something that we've got to continue to work to try to find uh, try to find what we can do to stop this horrible thing from happening. Thanks for thanks for allowing me to be a part of this. Well, we'll come back to both of those issues in a minute here, but Chairman, you've got a you've got a hearing coming this week about the future of VA in uh, mid twenty thirty, I think it is. What where where do you feel VA is now? Do you feel like we're in a well, I'm certainly very pleased with the work that uh, my predecessor, Tim Walls, uh, as ranking member, did with Chairman Monroe last year in a very bipartisan spirit. Uh, uh, it was a very productive committee, probably, I dare say, one of the most productive committees in Congress uh, in terms of the number of bills passed through our committee and actually signed them to all. Um, among them, I would say, most of them, most of them are very bipartisan basis. Um, uh, I am concerned about the implementation of the Mission Act. I'm concerned about uh, the way in which the new access standards uh, for care and community um, are, are being established. Uh, we still don't have a permanent undersecretary for health. Um, we're two years, more than two years into this administration. That's a very critical post. Uh, it doesn't be filled. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm worried about uh, just how uh, these access standards are going to, are going to be uh, finally uh, better. Um, I, I have concerns over uh, the rate at which uh, suicide prevention funds have been uh, spent or actually not spent uh, in, in the previous year and um, you know but I, I want to give the secretary uh, a chance to you know he's only been on the job since uh, you know, for a few months um, some critical positions as I said are, are, are not are, are not full um, and um, you know I'm, I am concerned that, uh, that we do proper oversight over the integration of the of the electronic medical health records and I know that uh, my colleague uh, the same thing, Dr. Rowe, uh, uh, he, he said to me before, I hope you're going to do an oversight, and I said, yes, we're going to continue the subcommittee that you established uh, on um, IT modernization. Um, you know, that's a 10 to $15 million project, and we've failed at it twice before, and I'm determined to make sure that we get it right. Um, you know, there, there, was, there was a disturbing article just uh, a few days ago in the Washington Post about uh, Veterans committing suicide in parking lots. Um, I, I intend as chairman to continue this tradition of uh, of, uh, of a bipartisan committee. I'm not looking to blow things up or uh, uh, inflame matters. I, I and just uh, next week we're intending also to uh, have a roundtable on veteran suicide. I want my committee members on a bipartisan basis to deepen their understanding about the complexities of addressing veteran suicide. Um, it's difficult. It's um, um, we know, we know that veterans, um, the majority of veterans committing suicide are are not connected with the VA. Um, these incidents that we've 
seen recently uh, uh, published in the, in the Washington Post, are of course veterans that were connected and where the VA fell down. Of course, we want to get to the bottom of that. Uh, but we definitely need organizations like the American Legion uh, to help us come up with strategies to reach those veterans who are not connected to the VA. Uh, because that's a disturbingly large number of veterans that are committing suicide today. So, uh, 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 VA 2030, let me just briefly mention that. We have an ever diversifying veteran population. It's more minorities are serving in the VA. We have uh, uh, serving in the armed services. We have uh, more women in there. We expect those numbers to increase. At least 15% of the veteran population is our women. I know that we have uh, the past president of the American Legion. Uh, First woman president, uh, and congratulations on your tenure. Uh, congratulations on your tenure. Uh, so we know that, um, you know, disturbing, it's one statistic says that 15%, 30% uh, uh, of women veterans screen positive for military sexual assault. Uh, and if that's true, uh, that is a very, very disturbing. Uh, and we believe it has some connection to the fact that women don't access their benefits uh, as much as they, as much as their male counterparts. And some VA medical centers have responded by establishing separate entrances to separate women women's clinics in the VA. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that uh, under my leadership, uh, we've established a women's veteran task force uh, that was led by Congresswoman Julia Brownlee. Uh, you can say, ooh, that's great. Uh, <laughs> uh, and she's going to be tasked with, um, with the known barriers uh, to women accessing benefits. We want to be able to overcome those barriers. And we want to bring to the surface the barriers that we don't want, the unknown knowns, or the unknown knowns, um, about uh, uh, women, uh, our own veterans. And, um, we, the VA 2030 plan is not a plan yet. It's a plan that we are writing as we begin to surface um, how we need to be prepared by the year 2030 to have a VA that can truly serve our diverse uh, veteran population that includes women, minorities. Actually, LGBT, we've, we've had, uh, you know, since the last Motel, don't tell, eight years since that policy has been lifted. So we know that the, there's going to be a lot of openly LGBT uh, members of the, uh, of the military who become veterans who need to be properly served by the VA. So uh, uh, that's going to be an emphasis uh, under my chairmanship uh, in the coming couple of years. A lot to unpack here, but Dr. Rowe, let me just let me just uh, a original question to you too. How do you, how do you feel about VA today versus a year ago when, when you were staring at one of these issues? Well, we had, thanks for the question. First of all, thank all of you veterans that are out there that really made all this possible. Got, uh, you're the ones with all the ideas. We simply implemented many of the ideas that you all brought up. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I said two years ago, I don't know how long I would be in the position. I was hoping I would be there longer than two years, but Chairman DeCott and I were close together, and, and I want to give a shout out to these two gentlemen to my right. Uh, they were great partners in the Senate to work with. And a shout out to both of you all. None of this would have happened without the cooperation of both of the Republicans, Democrats, House, and Senate. Let me just very quickly go through what I think we accomplished. We passed almost 80 bills, almost 50 of them were passed in the laws. We funded the VA at its highest level ever. When I came to, uh, to the Veterans Committee in 2009 as a freshman, we were spending on all veterans' benefits about $97 billion. That number was north of $200 billion this year. So the country stepped up. We need to be sure that we're spending this money wisely. The Secretary then Secretary Shorten came and said he needed some tools to be able to do the job better. One was the accountability and whistleblower protection, and we passed that. And one very near and dear to my heart because I used it when I got out of the military in uh, 1975 was the GI Bill. We passed it for every GI Bill where a veteran can now use that going forward. Uh, that benefit never sunsets, and one also very near and dear, dear to me. If you shed blood for this country, you can use your GI Bill for the rest of your life if you get a purple heart. And that should have been the way it should have been for your great <laughs> so, And I've always tried to thank you for your increased benefit. 
Um, we, we also funded the Choice Bill three different times to tune about $6 billion. We passed, and I hope we have time to discuss it in detail, the VA Mission Act, which I think will be transformative. And the Chairman's idea of 2030, we absolutely have to look at that. Let me just give you a quick uh, down in Berkeley. Bed, heads and beds and hospital beds peaked in 1981. The population has grown 40% since that time, and yet we have 10% less people in hospital beds. So the VA is transforming from this big, huge uh, hospital system to more outpatient. And, they now, and they're going in the right direction. 800 outpatient clinics, C-box around the country. I visited and gone from Long Island to Los Angeles and all points in between in the last two years. And, and quite frankly, the VA is doing a great job in some places and not so good in other places. So I'm glad we're having this hearing. Um, one last thing I want to say about the Blue Water Navy Bill. You know, Larry Burgundy misses a free throw. So we didn't get that one done. We passed that in the House, 382 to zero. And we just couldn't get it done in the Senate. There's been this uh, court ruling. Look, we need to do the right thing pass this bill and sign in the law. I stopped around and ran for Congress again in my in district and studied all my job at uh, is is the, the, the Blue Water Navy. I'm a Vietnam War veteran. I served in Korea. And so many men and women at the end of that war were treated poorly. And it's time to do the right thing and get it done. And I believe you know it's time I just believe and going forward, just one of the very quickly, uh, just lose 30 seconds. The, the, um, what the chairman said about the, uh, about the, the, the uh, CERN, the electronic health record, I put one in my office 12 years ago. It is a huge undertaking. I was out at Fairchild Air Force Base in Spokane and saw the difficulty that they were going through there. We have got to get this right because veterans' health, their benefits, Disability and so forth are related to how well we do this. If we mess this up, I told the uh, secretary, I want to go on the witness protection program. This would be that big of a screw up, I can tell you if we do. So we have got to get this right. That's why we set this subcommittee up on just technology, just implementation of this. It is a huge undertaking, much larger than DOD is. So that's one of the things I want to work on. And veteran suicide. If we can't, if we were spending $8 billion a year and haven't moved the needle one bit on the suicide rate in this country, we need to be doing something different. The chairman's going to start this hearing to not fully support that. Well, look, you all, you all mentioned suicide up here. Let's, let's start right there. I mean, Senator, you said you've got legislation coming out. What, what's the next step here? Because there has been a lot of effort. Uh, there's been a lot of attention. This is one of the Legion's top priorities for the coming year. Uh, but we haven't seen it. We haven't, we haven't seen that, that result yet. So, so what, what steps do you think need to be taken here beyond, I guess, there's the issue of not spending all the money, but, but what, else do you, what else do you need to do? Well, there's, there's a number of things, and I, I don't know if this bill will be the end all, but I think it will help. Uh, it will make sure that folks who transition out of the military have a year automatically of health care. Uh, it will make sure that, that nonprofits that are out there doing work in the area of telehealth can get access to some dollars. Um, but the, the, and it does a bunch of more stuff, and I could have my, my personal weapon list them off to you, but you'll know because it's all stuff that I think the American Legion and other VSOs have, have advocated for, and, and, and I think it's a step in the right direction. The other thing, and I know it's a step in the right direction, I think the other thing that has to happen though, there is, there is still, there is still a stigma around mental health and suicide that we have to figure out how to break, and I think the VSOs can, can help in that area a lot. Um, this is the 21st century. We know a lot more about the mind than we did in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And, and I can tell you unequivocally that uh, people that get help can have mental health conditions fixed just like you'd fix a broken arm, a dislocated knee, whatever it might be. So we, uh, we have to work as a group, as a society, to try to reduce, uh, to try to, to try to reduce the stigma as we try to take money and put it in the areas to do the most good. And I think it's around providers, it's around making sure that the veteran doesn't have to fight for the benefits that they have. It's making sure that the telehealth system, especially those more remote areas, is there and that network is there to be able to uh, provide the veteran with the health care and time. Chairman, you mentioned 
the hearing coming up. What what are you hoping to get out of that? Is it just going to be that that issue of not spending all of the available outreach funds, or are there other problems that you're seeing? It's actually not the hearing we have to set up. Okay. On, we had to set it up as, as a uh, as a round table. Um, we were able to let all the uh, Yeah, on a, on a short. Uh, you let all the reporters in now. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'll get back to you on that. I'll get back to you on that. Um, let's just say what I think. Uh, I'm interested in making sure that our members get down beneath some of these uh, stories in the paper. Um, yeah, I understand that there is some inaccuracies in that Washington Post uh, um, article, uh, some, some of its old information. Uh, but more than that, it, it's, a, it's a complex issue. I mean, uh, to the extent that there were scheduling problems and scheduling errors that led to the frustrations and the errors, I want to get to the bottom of that. I want to know where the VA is accountable uh, and hold the VA accountable for uh, issues such as that. Um, but there's also issues about, you know, Senator Tester mentioned this transition, making sure that the veterans have, and I think regardless of the discharge status, uh, that, they, that they have access to mental health care. Um, the, uh, there's something about a warm handoff. Uh, there's not a warm handoff. That the, because of our medical record issue, uh, there's a disconnect uh, between those veterans that are very, very vulnerable um, and the VA being able to uh, be able to uh, know who they are. So um, there's something about that transition that's a problem. There's uh, the, the other big problems that we, as I said earlier, my letter was the the older veterans. Uh, who aren't connected to the VA for a lot of different reasons. Um, many from the Vietnam War era had very bad experiences with the VA and want nothing to do with it. Um, and the question is how do we reach those disconnected folks um, who do pose, you know, uh, that they are at higher risk. Uh, and that's a, that's a different kind of issue. Um, that's really a, how do we uh, structure it, incentivize communities and find out which communities have been successful uh, at reaching out these veterans. One of the most inspiring things that I've done as a member of Congress, and I don't feel like you might have done this in your district, but it's, it's more of those Vietnam War um, lapel pins that commemorate the 50-year uh, anniversary of the war. And we've organized a couple of those in the district, and not a dry eye uh, exists after we do one of those. And we've had Vietnam vets come out of the woodwork uh, I, I have three friends who have listed together, not my friends, but uh, they were friends of themselves, three amigos. <laughs> they, they listed together, served together, came back together, hadn't really been together since they uh, came to uh, this event. There was one gentleman who said that uh, he put his medals away in a drawer and didn't want to wear them. And that ceremony of recognition for their service was the first time that he wanted to wear those medals and asked if I would pin them on him. Um, I'm suspecting that there are things that we need to do to still welcome home. Uh, these veterans would never were welcome home properly. Tell them that we appreciate them, that we admire them, uh, and that they're valued. Uh, and that's a, that's a whole other task that uh, this could bring America together in a much uh, more positive way. Um, uh, but how we, how we make that happen, uh, how we get America, and I suspect Americans would want to do this. Uh, so, uh, this task force will, is, I, I think, my first cut of trying to make sure that members on both sides of the aisle see this as a way to deepen their understanding of the complexities and begin to chip away at uh, you know, what the barriers are. There's, a, I think, a deep frustration over that we have allocated the money, but we're not moving the needle. Uh, but we, gotta, we, can't, we can't back off. We've got to keep our, our shoulder to the ground. Dr. Ray, you mentioned you want to talk about the Mission Act, so let's, let's talk about the Mission Act. Um, we, we've seen the draft standards out now. Uh, I know you all have had your own reactions to that. Where, how do you think they look? What do you think needs to be done at this point? You all talk about the importance of oversight, too. So, so for, for this crowd, what do they need to know about how those standards look right now and where you think the evolution happens over the next few months? Well, we got June the 6th. We were fortunate enough uh, to be able to meet right before Christmas with the Secretary and, and six months um, before this goes live on June 6th of this year. And then met with him at the White House about uh, two weeks ago. 
and they're working very hard. They rolled out the access standards, which are fine, and this was a tough bill to do because we, we had to try, we as a committee, and listen to you all, had to try to devise a, a bill that met urban needs and rural needs. That can be very hard. I was out in, in Oregon uh, with, uh, uh, in that particular district with Greg Walton, and his congressional district is larger than the square miles of the state of Tennessee. So you have to have a very different part of Montana where the Senator Custer is. I mean, that's an entire state. So we tried to do that, and there will be some problems with that. As, as you know, and we've got a shortage of physicians and, and providers around the country. We estimate by 2030, when the chairman's talking about, there will be 100,000 too few doctors in this country. So we've got a real issue with that, and that only goes to mental health, but just to your record checkup that you go to every day. But I think they're on, I think the Secretary Wilkie is on target. I think he's ready to go live June the 6th. I'm excited about it. I think he can be either trans. I told him this. I said, this will just be another piece of paper written our name on, or it can be absolutely transformative for VA. So you, you feel like we're close? To I think they're working hard. Yes. Chairman, how do you feel about what you've seen so far? Choice in terms of the Mission Act. This is the this is end all must do. I think the work that's been done in the House and the Senate, a long way for seems to be passing a good bill. We've got to just make sure the VA understands that there is no excuse for failure. There are going to be some things about the access standards you might not like, some things I might have changed. But when you think of what you have to write for a country as large as ours and diverse as ours, it's a good start. And, we, and that's what these hearings are about in terms of when they post the rules to have comment and make changes. So I think what we ought to do is instead of anticipating what's wrong with something before it even happens, let's anticipate what could be right or something. Let's have a good attitude. And I want to say one other thing. That the suicide issue. My age group is the Vietnam era. I lost my best friend in Vietnam, who was shot by a sniper, Jack Cox, Jackson Elliott Cox from Waynesboro, Georgia. I spent a lot of time doing things. This is the 50th anniversary, by the way, Vietnam War this year. Sorry. Uh, on the suicide issue in Vietnam, and with all cases, it is not exactly what a lot of us think it is. In many cases, it is somebody reacting to the what the hand is dealt them in life, which in some cases could not be the fault of, of access to a counselor, but the fault of somebody who treated them for a disease that didn't do a very good job of their suffering from that disease. I think one thing we have to remember: we have a lot of guys that came home from Vietnam that would have come home, not come home from any other war because the injuries. Our medicine improved, and that's unbelievable. You know, with the prosthesis, with all the people who walk again, who could eat again, who could do a lot of things they just couldn't do before. And that's a great compliment to the advancement of medicine, Dr. Wood and VA has done. But because of that, a lot more came on live, a lot more had needs that are much greater than what's the average for the veteran who survived So we've got to make sure that all our medical services those vets are good so they don't get in a case where they're frustrated. I'll just give you one example. Think about anybody in the world that should, that should not have a bad attitude, it's Robin Williams. Robin Williams is my age, was, was my age. Robin Williams killed himself last year. He killed himself because of the Lewy body dementia, which he had been diagnosed with, which he just couldn't deal with any longer. And, and, uh, Lewy body dementia is a thing that affects a lot of people, and it's a tough thing because it's the worst of all dementias. But there are a lot of diseases that are aggravated that we can do a lot better improving the health care we want for these folks. So it's not just it's not just getting them psychological care, it's making sure they're treated all have access to good health care all along so we give them a chance to go when they do get frustrated. But, but does that steer into the concerns that, that these two gentlemen are going to talk about with the with the Mission Act and with the outside care, that if you're sending veterans to uh, to physicians who may not know to look for certain things related to the military. Um, that you're, you're increasing the potential risk that things like burn pits or PTSD or TBI get missed and that there's too much focus by this administration on the outside care rather than, than building up that, that Center for Excellence at VA. I'll be real short since you're asking I'm curious to the other question. Yes. Not taking too much time already. Uh, we're not privatizing the VA, period. Understand that a veteran deserves first play, first chance. 
and good care. So we're going to make sure the standards are equal and the access is equal. We ain't privatizing nothing. However, if we find a private sector doctor who, who because of the choice act and everything we've done is, has access to better doing a good job, we're going to fire him. Not use it anymore. And if a veteran's administration doctor doesn't do a good job, we've got more guy here, we have to get rid of him. We're going to have standards of care that are going to be great for our best and make it work. Um, I can't help but think that this is a liberalization 
Uh, it's a step in the liberalization in the sense of uh, it's a more open access standard, which is going to mean potentially far more people eligible to uh, access uh, care. And I don't know what the modeling they're using. They've actually forecasted uh, how many more veterans will, uh, will use care in the community. And if they don't ask for more money, that's going to inevitably mean a drain on resources uh, of the internal capacity. Um, I'm, I'm so glad to hear uh, my colleague Phil Rowe talk about the, uh, the need for more physicians, more providers. It's not the, the medical workforce in our country needs attending to. Uh, this 100,000 doctor shortage is very alarming. Now, I can tell you my own situation in Riverside, California, where Loma Linda is on the other side of the county line with San Bernardino County. Um, in California, 30 minutes is nothing, right? Uh, to, to, to drive across, drive that people commute from my community into Los Angeles an hour and a half, two hours every day. Uh, but if suddenly everybody who lives 30, 30 minutes away from Loma Linda, why is that the county's eligible for private sector care? That's not a solution because they're going to wait just as long uh, for some of those uh, appointments as they would uh, have to drive over the end. Um, so that's, it's not a solution in my area uh, for on the face of it. So I have a lot of questions. I'm not saying necessarily this, this, this access standard they've established is going to be the, be, the, be the doom of it. But as Senator Pester said, in fact, by sort of default, we could see a withering away of uh, the, the I know, I know you focused a lot on the vacancies within VA, and we just saw some new numbers this week. They've got 49,000 um, vacancies throughout the system. It's steadily improving up a little bit, but you know, there, there's an argument to be made that it needs to be more higher. There's also an argument to be made that if those doctors aren't there, veterans shouldn't have to wait while, while they figure out the hiring process. So how do you how do you balance those two things? How do you say, look, you know? We need to find a way to make sure the veterans can care and setting these standards while we fix the other things to, to build up to the end. Well, um, I guess in my, in my particular area, uh, you know, choice is not necessarily the solution. I mean, we have, we have a, a community shortage right here. We're, we're under, we're under doctor. Uh, part of the, a big response is we need, we need more doctors and we need to use uh, this critical shortage at the VA as part of building the political will uh, to work with uh, the Medicare funded doctors, the VA funded doctors, the HQ, the, uh, the federal FQHC funded doctors. I didn't even know this. I've learned more about medical residencies in my six years than I thought I would I learn about. The children's hospitals have a separate line of core medical residencies. And uh, we need to uh, train more doctors, and frankly, this is a great opportunity for us to get more Americans uh, in these uh, in these residencies. And uh, we have a lot of we have a lot of medical students who don't match to those residencies. People don't realize that the federal government is the key, uh, is the spigot on our doctor uh, supply. Uh, it's not the medical schools; it's, it's the federal government's been largely responsible. For and it's, it's, it's the shortage is affecting the VA, but I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a larger. So the overall supply needs to be increased. Uh, we should be having deep conversations about the whole medical workforce, whether it's nurses, doctors, technicians. Tremendous opportunities to train America. Uh, and serving our veterans is a good reason uh, to have that conversation. What I'm going to see when I do these things is that I see it through the eyes of, of a physician who has seen you one on one, not as a whole system. What I want from the patient. And I practice both in a VA, it's from my training in a VA hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. I've been in the public sector, the private sector, been a military doctor, I've deployed overseas. I've seen about all of it. And what I'm most interested in is you getting timely quality care. I don't care where it is. I want you to get to the VA to provide that care, and that's great if they can. And what we have to do, and one of the reasons this electronic health record is so important, is that the NIDRA system is going to be able to provide everything for you. So there are going to be situations like in neurology, it's very different subspecialties that you don't need to refer. 
And so I think you use, they're doing a market analysis across the whole country now. So we'll know in a community what that community can provide for veterans. And sometimes it may be, I'll give you an example. Um, I, I had a year and a half of prostate cancer, had surgery. The, the doctor who did my surgery at home was a friend of mine. And he no longer sees VA patients because the VA wouldn't pay his group time. So they've lost access because the VA's inability to pay their bills access to some great people now that are having to be sent long distances to be able to uh, to get care. Another example I'll give you is last year I kind of put my nose maybe where it should have been, but I pushed a little bit hard and we got a robot down at the National VA. They can now we got a great young surgeon down there, uh, Dr. Stenson. He, he's now doing these uh, these surgeries that would have been sent out otherwise. So we have to know these things, but the quality of care you get is what I'm most interested in. You getting the care you need in a timely way, and I know everybody up here feels the same way. That's not privatization, that's quality care. Hey, right, we're going to move to the lightning round section here because we still got a lot of topics to cover. But what we've got to get into is the blue water mid, which I think you referenced earlier. Uh, we've got this court ruling now that says VA is responsible for, uh, for awarding those benefits. Uh, we'll, we'll see if VA decides to appeal that. But what, what is the plan in Congress right now to? To deal with this, you guys, you guys got the work done last year. I assume we're just going to roll ahead with the same sort of proposal, or do you see major changes to what uh, what uh, Dr. O put together last year? Well, in light of the court decision, uh, the pay for it is significantly less, and I'm pushing my staff to, to get a bill to floor as soon as possible. Uh, we're also having simultaneous conversations with uh, you know the staff on the Senate, uh, but I hope to feel like you know. I know that we've heard, I've heard through my staff that you know, I'm interested in getting the markup as soon as possible uh, out of committee because uh, we do have to make some adjustments in the light of the court decision. Uh, I'm hoping that the secretary uh, is not going to appeal the decision, uh, but but I think uh, just to be doubly sure, Congress needs to needs to get a bill passed and signed into law uh, expeditiously, uh, regardless of where this may end up in uh, the 90-day uh, appeals uh, period. What, a, what about the Senate side? Do you think you can get it through now the court decisions hanging there? I'll wake up at night dreaming about the Blue Water Navy. A few months of my service last year was all about that and a few people that made my life miserable. But quite frankly, we don't have any misery right now. The one miserable problem has gone away. Another miserable problem is doing something else like running for president. So I have a lot less time to have a lot less time to fight me. Because of Mr. Takano and because of Phil, we're in great shape, and because John is a great soldier for the Blue Warrior, we're, we're in great shape. So even though they don't have a big potion in the Bahamian and Montana, we're working on that. But anyway, let me say this, and John and I haven't had time to discuss this, so if I say something incorrect, John, you can correct me if you will. But I think we all, I think the VA ought not to appeal the decision. That's number one. That would make everything as simple as possible. Two, since the and one of the gentlemen, someone said about the pay for the court decision lowers the cost of the pay for. If we go ahead and act like you were referring to that, because that's another good thing, although it's kind of a false positive. It never has uh, so we ought to go ahead and do that. But if, they, if the court does it, if the VA does it, we'll take another bill up and go. We, we, nothing has been better vetted than we did on that bill. We were late to the party. I mean, Phil Rowe was the first person. He, he got life and got the house work one day. God came to us, and I had a couple of my, you know, in the Senate, to get things done a lot of times, especially the last session, you have to do a, a, an open UC and hold it on by the objectives so you can have an early debate to get a bill over to the House. We tried that on the Blue Water Navy and three times and it was objected to each time by one person who really was doing so for, because of their responsibilities on the budget, they felt like it was going to cost too much money, and I explained to them. If we go ahead and do it, we'd have exactly what's true now with the decision of the course of debate. The cost wouldn't be as high for legislative purposes. But since that's gone now, the answer to your question is we're going to look and take up what the House sends us as quick as we can, or we'll put up something for us to take up as quick as we can, and we'll encourage the VA to say, you know, we're not going to appeal this, it's time to make this happen. And then we'll go start digging around in rocks and where else we'll find money and start finding money and pay for it. Senator, that's a great song. Yeah. <laughs>